Every console has its timeless masterpieces, titles that end up defining the collective memory of their console generation. You're gonna be hard pressed to find a retrospective article on the SNES that won't mention A Link to the Past, Super Metroid, or Donkey Kong Country, or engage in a discussion about the Dreamcast without hearing about Shenmue. In that regard, the Sony PlayStation might be blessed with more of these unforgotten timepieces than any other console. Because it's hard to stop listing titles that are exemplary for that era, that look and feel, and that technical state of the art. Final Fantasy VII, Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil, Resident Evil 2, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, Gran Turismo, the Tekken series, Crash Bandicoot, and I could go on. But with so many games that define this historic idea of the PlayStation, there had to be some that, despite being in no way inferior, ended up being somewhat pushed to the sidelines. Games that have maintained a quiet but resilient cult following over the years, but that many outsiders sadly have never heard of. To me, one title that fits this description perfectly is Vagrant Story. Vagrant Story is a 3D tactical action JRPG published by Squaresoft in 2000, and it bears all the hallmarks of a timeless masterpiece. A striking and memorable aesthetic and presentation, a unique and challenging combat system, and a profound and gripping storyline. And all of it set in an intriguing and unconsumed universe. It received critical acclaim and was financially successful too, but ultimately ended up being a little overshadowed by other contemporary Squaresoft titles of the time, like Final Fantasy IX and Chrono Cross, that it has, over time, become something like an insider's tip. And without question, one of my favorite forgotten gems. The Kingdom of Valendia is engulfed in civil war. Wait. Valendia? That might ring a bell if you're a Final Fantasy veteran. Because Vagrant Story takes place in the same fictional universe as Final Fantasy XII, and was created and directed by Yasumi Matsuno, who, surprise, also was the initial director for Final Fantasy XII, responsible for its setting and plot, as well as the often overlooked but marvelous games Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre. Vagrant Story's main plot revolves around the besieged city of Leia Mond and the dark powers that lie dormant within its walls. At the height of a series of political rivalries, several power-hungry factions attempt to take over Valendia in what almost feels like a Cold War thriller set in a pseudo-medieval setting, with the player tossed right into the center of a web of corruption and Machiavellian backstabbery. Unraveling this cat-and-mouse game of hidden motives and secret agendas, it's part of its charm. The game begins with a nightly attack on the estate of Duke Bardoba, a key political leader whose power is, as we find out, magically tied to the city of Lea Mond. During this attack, the religious organization known as the Mullenkampf cult, led by the enigmatic and mysterious Sidney Lossatrod, attempts to steal a powerful artifact that is key to Leomon's dark powers. It's complicated. In response, Valendia's council sends out Ashley Riot, a so-called risk breaker of the Valendian Knights of the Peace, or VKP, and the hero we control. Risk breakers are elite agents trained and specialized for controversial government operations under plausible deniability the medieval equivalent of Black Ops, if you will. So Ashley investigates the estate and goes on the hunt for Sidney and his cult followers, trailing him to the ruins of Lea Mond. He infiltrates the city through its ancient catacombs in an attempt to confront and stop Sidney from seizing the city's power for his own evil agenda. Or at least that's what we assume he's doing. Vagrant Story's plot is like an onion. Not in that it's satirical, but it is assembled in many layers. As I've said before, there's a lot to uncover over the course of these events, including Ashley's own mysterious past, that, like with many things in this game, isn't as straightforward as it appears at first glance. The cast of characters that takes part in this culmination of Valendia's civil war almost feels like a Shakespearean stage play. 
There are no bland cliché villains that are evil for the sake of being antagonists, but every character's motivations are fleshed out and open to scrutiny. The game's visual aesthetic is based on a very distinctive, mellow, yet gritty hand-drawn anime style, which can be found, for instance, on the magnificent cover art in the manual and also in the complimentary comic. It's striking to me how well this concept design got translated into actual 3D settings and environments, especially considering the heavy technical limitations of the time. The scenes feature dramatic and effectful lighting and the models and animations feel surprisingly detailed and expressive, despite the low poly count and texture resolution of the time. I mean, they even realized Ashley's iconic strands of hair in a time when characters had like five polygons. <laughs> Especially compared to its contemporary juggernaut competitors like Metal Gear Solid, the facial animations are surprisingly expressive and convincing and convey an unexpected amount of nuance for that time. Valendia's set designs blend elements from various mythologies and historical periods into a unique pastiche of impressions. There's Renaissance France, Hanseatic Germany, Sword and Sandals seasoned with a pinch of Tolkien, Wuxia and Hamlet. Matsuno himself stated that he was inspired by everything from Shakespeare to Jet Li for the conception of Vagrant Story. The plot itself is told through several hours of in-game cutscenes that exert an almost theatrical feel, with stark cuts and dramatic camera angles all underlined by an epic orchestral soundtrack. Vagrant Story has so much to offer that it's a challenge to merely list all its merits in a comprehensive summary like this one. But I believe the biggest reason the creators managed to get so many elements of it right is that they knew where to cut. And while, for example, the soundtrack is even ostentatious at times and the sound effects effectful and juicy, the game contains no voice acting but relies on animated comic speech bubbles. And in order to allow the PS1's hardware to render detailed and rich environments, the game's engine restricts the areas to rather tiny segments, solely optimized for a highly restricted camera angle. But maybe more than anything else, what makes Vagrant Story stand out among its genre peers is its combat system, the heart of the gameplay, because it is, until this day, one of a kind in concept and execution. The game usually gets categorized as an action RPG, but that doesn't truly do it justice. Creator and director Matsuno conceived a unique mixture of systems and genres that hadn't been assembled in this way before and haven't been attempted again since. In an interview published alongside the bonus material of the original release of the game, he was asked if he would describe the game as an action game, a role-playing game, a strategy game, an adventure game, or... to which he replied, Vagrant Story encompasses all of these genres, and at the same time, it doesn't fit into any of them. In a bad way, it takes bits and pieces from various types of games. In a good way, it is a new breed of game that does not take any form of pre-existing style. And it becomes quickly apparent what he means by that when you play it for yourself. I'd like to think that each of its individual elements, be it something directly taken from other games or unique elements that were specifically conceived for it, all form a vital pillar of what makes Vagrant Story's gameplay so unprecedented and memorable. You control Ashley Riot from a free-roaming, isometric perspective in real time, but unlike in more hack-and-slash oriented RPGs like, say, Diablo, combat is orchestrated via pausable action menus. When you press the attack button, a spherical grid appears, tracing the three-dimensional range of Ashley's current weapon. Should an enemy be in reach, we can target their individual body parts for the attack. But you don't just plainly hack away. In order to optimize the attack's efficiency, you can assign up to three different combo attacks to the circle, square and triangle buttons, adding special buffs like increased damage, weapon repair, mana or health regeneration and so on. Once the attack starts, you can attempt to chain further attacks by timing the combo buttons at the exact right moment. If you hit the mark, you can make Ashley chain up to 15 attacks with special attributes in a row, uninterrupted before the enemy gets their turn. Now, since every chain attack comes with its own animation and timing, this makes the fencing sequences almost feel like a rhythm game, a sword fighting DDR, if you will. Getting better at chaining is the game's prime way of drastically increasing the efficiency of your weapon art. 
But that is really only one part of the equation. If you could just hone your reflexes and endlessly chain attacks without giving your opponents a chance to respond, there'd be no strategic challenge. So the more you relentlessly chain attacks and employ powerful special skills, the more it will fill up the risk bar. Risk is a unique resource to Vagrant Story's combat system. The pat description is basically the more risk you acquire, the less likely you are to hit your enemy, the more likely you are to get hit, the less damage you deal and the more you take, and so on and so on. So it is in your best interest to keep your risk level as low as possible or you'll end up missing the broadside of a barn with your sword strokes. So since you can't simply spam attacks, especially against more powerful foes later on, you need to constantly work on optimizing everything to get the most out of every single attack. So you have to learn a lot and prepare for each encounter, analyze your enemies, learn their strengths and weaknesses and plan accordingly. For me, replaying the game, this aspect, the fact that getting intel about your enemies, optimizing your loadout, spells, potions and strategies for each major encounter is the core challenge, it strongly reminded me of what made the combat in The Witcher 3 so unique and memorable. How careful planning and preparation is at least as important as skill and sharp reflexes if you want to come out on top of tough encounters. Vagrant Story's combat system is deep, complex and oftentimes pretty opaque. Many different elements, systems and stats stack up and intertwine that you first have to uncover, understand and then use to your advantage to become a successful and efficient risk breaker. You can find combat guides on sites like GameFAQs that encompass dozens if not hundreds of pages of stats, strategies and data, so it's quite impossible to give a full account here, but let me at least try to give you a brief overview of what to expect. So every enemy belongs to a creature class, like humans, beasts, undead, spirits and so on and so on. Each class is weak against certain weapon classes, magic types and attack patterns and resilient against others. All of this is not openly telegraphed by the game, but you have to actively analyze new enemies with specific skills to learn about their ins and outs. So grab your pencil and lots of paper to keep track, because you're going to be engaged in a lot of micromanagement. If you approach every encounter with a single favorite loadout like you usually can in most RPGs without constant optimization, you will eventually hit a brick wall, guaranteed. So you have to make sure to carry a small arsenal of various weapon types and armor sets to be prepared for the vast variety of opponents and combinations thereof. You'll also have to constantly reassign different chain attacks as well as cleverly employ spells, buffs and curses in order to outsmart your enemies. So yeah, really, before each major fight, you'll find yourself reassigning your button layout, re-equipping your loadout and boost different character stats with magic so you can, for example, stun lock a magically skilled adversary that would otherwise wreak havoc on you with his attack spells. Oh, and I didn't even mention, there is a whole customization system built on top of that that you cannot afford to ignore. From time to time you'll find workshops, combat free rooms in which you can take your collected weapons and armament apart and combine their shapes and materials to forge new, more powerful blades, handles, assemble them and craft unique equipment embellished with magical gemstones, but this only works if you have at least a little bit of knowledge of the various metals, weapon types and the rules under which they merge to superior materials. <sighs> yes, Vagrant's story is complex very, very complex and the game doesn't exactly go out of its way to take you by the hand at all times. When you approach it with a modern happy-go-lucky mindset and expect it to ease you in and pull you along somehow, you're gonna have a hard time. Now I'm certainly not an MLG level JRPG player and Matsuno stated that he intended Vagrant Story for a core gamer audience. So as someone who is not inept, but also nowhere near impeccable at tactical RPGs, I gotta say it put me through some unexpected friction at times. Because this game, if you don't pay attention, just leaves you in the dirt. If you don't skill considerately and don't put in the time and effort to learn its ins and outs of smithing, enemy types, combat and magic system, you might find yourself at a dead end after like one third of the game. 
At least that's what happened to me. After a good eight hours, I found myself with a completely misskilled character and loadout, overwhelmed by a sudden surge of practically undefeatable bosses, and it brought me pretty close to giving in. Biting the bullet, regressing to an earlier point, learning from my mistakes, and investing the time and effort to come out on top in the end, it was really worth it. And in my opinion, this is ultimately one of Vagrant Story's absolute strong points in terms of gameplay. It's such an unusual and intriguing system that doesn't shy away from bludgeoning you to death if you don't watch out. But when you do, and you cross that threshold and feel that almost palpable click in your mind, when you suddenly got it, then it releases a great amount of old school video game satisfaction that'll make you feel like you've just turned into a true risk breaker. Now, to spice things up between non-interactive cutscenes, strategic planning phases, and rhythmic battle dances, you will also regularly encounter what I think is an almost comically recurring trope in early 3D games from that era. Cube puzzles. <laughs> Vagrant Story, just as Soul Reaver, which we've talked about in the last episode, as well as so many games of that time, came up with the idea to push, pull, lift and stack cubes to solve lateral thinking challenges as a change of pace from time to time. They're nothing special, really. So if you're into these kinds of puzzles, you might enjoy them. But if you're here simply for the sake of a great RPG and a captivating story, they might get a bit distracting and tedious over time especially in later stages of the game. And I mean, don't these puzzles always feel painfully gamey? Like, they don't have any justification in the world's suspension of disbelief. So when I encounter this trope, it always invokes this feeling of... Who builds this shit? Now aside from those slightly shoehorned puzzle sequences that might feel like a drag to some, the only real complaint that I have is that the story is, for the most part, told separately to the actual game. Ashley infiltrates Leamon through the ruins and generally finds himself underground a lot, while most of the important events take place within the city, and for the biggest part in his absence. So, a lot of the actual plot takes place in sudden visions or straight-up cutaway scenes. Add to that the fact that you never interact with any non-combat NPC in any way, it sometimes feels like you're not actively participating in the story at all, and I think that's a lot of missed potential. Because the game even shows that it's capable of telling its story through mechanics on occasion. For instance, in a mid to late game boss fight where, for the only time in the entire game, you fight alongside Sidney Lossetrod against a common foe, with him being controlled by a friendly AI. And it immediately oozes narrative weight and makes this encounter feel so much more important than the usual monster bashing on the sidelines of the main plot. It's one of the few times where it feels like story and combat are entwined and not two separate entities, and it's kind of sad that there aren't more moments like this. But all in all, this is high-level nitpicking. There's something about this particular era, video games' first big step towards adulthood, with Sony targeting a more mature audience and the PlayStation's technical capabilities and storage space unleash on a cadre of aspiring auteurs and soon-to-be legendary designer teams, we got blessed by a plethora of avant-garde titles that remain relevant and important up to this day. Vagrant Story is everything but an exception to that rule, but an integral part of this league of unforgotten landmarks of video game history. Back in the day, it only came out on the Sony PlayStation, but by now is also available as a PS1 classic in the PSN store for PS3 and PS Vita. The footage in this video was recorded with the ePSXE emulator with enhanced resolution and shaders. If you're interested in emulating it yourself, you'll find a document linked in the description in which I assembled a few tips and tricks that worked for me to get it running flawlessly, so you don't have to jump through the same hoops getting Vagrant Story to run on modern hardware as I had to. So my hope is that with this video, I could make Vagrant Story a little less of a forgotten gem. Now, you probably might have gotten the impression by now that for me, replaying Vagrant Story after over 15 years had been a true blast. You might even say, a blast from the past. 
And isn't that convenient? Because my friend Michael Saber and I have recently started an audio podcast. And it's even called Blast from the Past. In each episode, we casually get together for an hour or two to talk about a game from our childhoods. And since even a 20-minute video essay didn't really feel enough for me to go into all the things I would have liked to, we decided to make Vagrant Story the topic of our most recent episode. So if you're a fan of podcasts or just pod curious, follow the link in the description. You can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. Whatever you like. We're waiting for you. Thank you guys for watching. And also, thank you for providing the topic for this episode. The reason I picked Vagrant Story for this forgotten gem is you. So let's continue with this. If you have a game that you believe deserves to be covered as a forgotten gem, give me your suggestion in the comments section and simply add hashtag gem suggestion. And as always, I would like to express my gratitude to the people who literally make this channel possible, namely my Patreon supporters. Please consider pitching in if you are looking forward to more Forgotten Gems in the future. And a special thank you goes out to these top tier supporters. Arcel Markison, Cory Laflamme, Caroline Mills, Quentin Prodom, James Lynch, Lucas, Thwagam, Jackson Brasil, Tony Flesher, Travis Deng, Evan Tekru, Kiristar Haku, Adam Burr, Nick Lazell, Malam, Christopher Nuregat, Matt Davis, Yulia, David Nadeau, The Melting Squad, Simon Chomsland, Sean Quigley, Sean Holiday, Cole Davies, Angrim, Roman Wasenmüller, Nathan de Grand, Dark Blue One, Ian Oblivion, a stand up comedian, Alex Lake, Jiho Shin, Kaspar Ram, Kala Spilari, Siri Agnath Eliasson, Austin Ortega, Jason Johns, Brand Rupert, Morrigan, Maxwell Brown, Subject Matter Games, Max Herbert, Nilani Telemoni, Brusev Jones, James Lewis, David Zelenak, Karl Jura, Martin Schmidt, River Rudard, Conrad Kurtz, Austin Berry, Sarah Thompson, Brian Vieira, Adam Cross, Matthew Daly, Sonny Mellard, Mura Casardes, Michael Spina IV, Travis Leneve, Struggler, Jordan Farrell, Dennis Pfefferkorn, Mr. Bergadon, Space Lagomorph, Matthias Fowler, Decim, Rational User, Philip Kirchner, Midorino, Chase Ladner, Pascal Fehling, Milan Vujnovic, Yasin Inat, Andrei Kriakushin, Wojciech Bukowski, Sebastian Garcia, Jacob Woodward, Dmitry Pirak, Luke Johnson, Danny Sendel, Thiago Pereira dos Santos Silva, Carlos Vega, Marissa Martinez, Michelle Stoliker, Adele Alfalasi, Christopher Kalish, Nicholas Stevenson, and Ronnie Minot. So until next time, ta-ta for now. <laughs>